Good afternoon. My name is Leticia Costa, and director of the Subiendo Academy for Rising Leaders. And on behalf of the University of Texas, the Macomb School of Business, our team leaders and staff, I say welcome to day three of the Subiendo Academy. I know we're almost halfway there. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our, our keynote speaker for joining us today. Commissioner Hope Andrade will be joining us and giving us her story. We're very excited to learn your experience and to impart that, that wisdom and knowledge that you've gained over the years with our students. So thank you for being with us. We appreciate that. Before I invite Alma Rivera, who will be introducing our keynote speaker, I'd like to take a few moments to thank the individuals who make our program a reality. To our donors, our friends of Subiendo, we thank them for their generous support in, in belief in empowering and developing these future leaders for our state. To our corporate partner, Southwest Airlines, who make traveling from the far corners of our state possible for our students, thank you very much. And thank you to our advisory council members who help in programming and, and help so much in developing certainly the curriculum, but inviting speakers to come join us and to go and traveling to different high schools to um, serve as our outreach efforts. So thank you. I see Wolfgang Niedert, who's done that many times, and certainly for Miguel, Miguel Romano. I think I saw him in here. Thank you, Miguel, for you know, certainly for t inviting today's speaker. Thank you very much for that. Let's give them a round of applause. So to invite our student who will be joining us here in a moment, I'd like to invite Alma Rivera to please join me. And let's give her some round of applause to and big encouragement. So hi, my name is Alma Rivera. I'm part of the Otters, and I'm here to help us introduce Hope Andrade. So Hope Andrade is a commissioner representing employers for the Texas Workforce Commission. Commissioner Andrade is the, ad, as the advocate for more than 485,000 Texas employers. Prior to her appointment to the TWC, Andrade served as Texas 107th Secretary of State from July 2008 to November 2012. As Secretary of State, Andrade is one of the six state officials in the executive branch of the Texas state government. Andrade was, was Texas's first Latina Texas Secretary of State and the fourth longest serving secretary in our state's history. Andrade has been an entrepreneur and a leader in the state in the San Antonio business community for more than three decades. She has served in multiple leadership roles in the San Antonio civic causes, including the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Free Trade Alliance of San Antonio, United Way, and the Board of Trustees for Our Lady of the Lake University. So please help me in welcoming Hope Andrade. Alma, thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Good. Can you see me? Good. Alma, thank you so much for that great introduction. And Leticia, thank you for the leadership that you provide this great academy, uh, for the opportunity that you give these young students that are the future uh, of our state. I also want to give a special thanks to the Advisory Council, uh, Miguel Romano, for inviting me. Thank you so much for believing that these students needed to hear my story. And, uh, and a story that I'm excited to share with you because I hope that when you, whenever there's a thought of a weakness or a doubt of what your future may be or if you will get there, I hope that you'll remember this luncheon and say, you know what, if she could do it, I could too. So that, uh, I, I look forward to sharing that story with you. But, um, you know, for, for the students that are participating in this program, uh, I congratulate you, I salute you for, uh, for doing this. Uh, many times um, there are programs that are made available uh, and, uh, and the students are perhaps afraid or perhaps not comfortable, uh, but you all took that step and you all joined and you're here, so you all deserve an applause because you're very fortunate to be able to participate in this great program. So let's give each other a, hand, a round of applause. You know, many people, when, when you hear my bio, uh, many people ask, well, you know, 
how did you do it? Uh, was your father in politics? Do you come from a family that had political interests? And, and the answer is no. I, uh, I don't come from a family that had political interests. As a matter of fact, my background is that uh, my father was from Mexico. Uh, my mother was from Texas. They met here uh, picking cotton in, uh, in Yoakum, Texas. And, um, and uh, you know, my father thought that uh, coming to the United States, he'd be able to uh, provide a, or have a better life, and that when he got married, he'd be able to provide a better life for his family. So truly, uh, you know, he believed that this was a land of unlimited opportunity. And so um, I was a, a shrimp of a little girl that um, kids made fun at because um, I was small. I uh, didn't speak English. Uh, my parents didn't speak English. Um, we were poor, although I never knew we were poor because I was rich with love from them. And, uh, and I didn't play any sports. So I was never the little girl that anybody invited on their team. And you see, this is me at first grade, and there I am at four years old. So I don't look like a little girl that anybody would want on their basketball team. <laughs> and sometimes I'd get invited to for baseball, but they'd leave me on the bench. Okay, but if you fast forward, okay, we're gonna fast forward to several years. Amy? You're gonna see that all those that never invited me to their team, after this happened, everybody wanted me on their team. Half of San Antonio was there. How many of you all are from San Antonio? Okay. I, I wanted, I, I bring this video to you because I wanted you to share in the pride of being from the west side of San Antonio, for a be, from being a little girl that, you know, was made fun of, to becoming the first Latina Secretary of State of the second largest state in the nation. Anything is possible. The great news that I bring you also is that you live in Texas, in a state where it doesn't matter what your last name is, it doesn't matter where you come from, all that matters is how hard you're willing to work to get, to get where you wanna be. That's all it does. There's no magic formula. I'm not here to give you a formula that says, in 10 years you will be this. The magic formula is education, okay? We've got to break that barrier where people say that we as Hispanics are not educated. Now, I come here to UT and every time I come here I get goosebumps because it's an incredible institution. You know, when I traveled the world as Secretary of State promoting Texas, people would come up to me and say, I'm a Longhorn. And I'd say, you're a Texan. No, I'm a Longhorn. <laughs> the spirit, the pride is incredible and it will be with you for the rest of your life. But if you don't come to Texas, it's okay, as long as you get on some college campus. Now, you know, my story is that I didn't go to school until I was in my 20s and I, because my parents didn't understand the importance of education. But once my husband and I, and I got married at 18, once my husband and I went to work and realized that we weren't gonna move up and we didn't get an education, we signed up for night school, weekend school, wherever we could uh, get our education. 
But I, but I want to share with you that I do have, there are roots in this Andrade family from UT because my daughter-in-law graduated from UT. So let me show you my family. Here's my daughter-in-law and my grandson Alejandro at a UT game. Here's Ramirito with his longhorn pajamas and robe, going to, getting ready to prepare for bed. And when you ask him what is he going to dream, he says, Grandma, I'm going to dream that one day I'm going to play football at UT. That's a dream. And I don't discourage him. I don't want to tell him, Mijito, you're so little. I don't know that you'll ever be able to play football. <laughs> Your grandma wasn't a good athlete, but I never tell him that. So one day, who knows? He may be, OK? Here he is at school, OK? It was his birthday. What did he ask for? A longhorn decorated cake to make sure that all his friends knew that one day he's going to be a longhorn, OK? Here's a, look, they're cooking in their jerseys. That's our favorite thing. Once they get home from school, to put on their jerseys and play or cook or whatever. And this is the yearly pumpkin at their doorstep. Do you think there's any question of what their dreams are of where they're going to go to school? So I hope that you also have a dream of some school, any college campus. You know, when, when I walked around a little bit and got to meet some of you, and I hear about the dreams that you have about a pediatrician, about an accountant, about a nurse anesthesiologist, a physical therapist. That's great. I didn't have many dreams. And my mother had two goals for me. Remember, this is, this, I come from parents that, that didn't understand the importance of education. My mother's first goal, and, and, and I know you don't relate to this, and I don't want you to relate to this, but maybe your parents or your grandparents do is that I should get married right after high school, because that was what was expected of me. And so being the good daughter that I am, I got married when I was 18, as soon as I finished high school. The second goal that my mother had for me was that she knew of a woman down the street that was a secretary. And she admired her because she'd see her dress up every morning and walk out to the bus stop. And she'd tell me about that she worked in an office. And he said, ay, mijita, you know, tiene una oficina. Well, I granted my mother's second wish also. I became a secretary, secretary of state. <laughs> so my story is that I came from the west side of San Antonio to having my very own office, not just an office, a suite on the east side of the Capitol. So anything is possible through hard work. I also believe that a lot of the self-confidence that I have today uh, is because of the love of my parents. You know, Abraham Lincoln once said that his success, he owed it to his mother. And I would tell you that the same thing. The love of my, that my mother offered me, provided for me, and mind you that I was adopted. And so there was a lot of rejection in the family because uh, back then when you, you were adopted, you weren't as accepted as a family member. But my mother absolutely adored me unconditionally. And my father taught me hard work. He was a gardener. He would often would take me on his jobs during the summer to help him bag leaves or just you know, be there with him. And he'd open those garage doors of these affluent neighborhoods in Alamo Heights and Terrell Hills. And he'd point into those garages and he would say, you see that Cadillac? And I'd say, yes, and he says, I want you to work hard so that one day you can have a Cadillac, mijita. And so the story of that is that one day I did buy a Cadillac, but I bought it for him. And that was my motivation. My motivation was that my parents loved me so much and I loved them back so much. I wanted to make them proud. I wanted to make them proud. And so everything I did was to make them proud. I worked at a very, since a very early age, since I was 12 years old because I always wanted to help them, to provide a little bit more for them so my dad didn't have to work two or three jobs. Immediately afterwards, it was the, the gratification of seeing my mother open a bag and I had bought her some new shoes or a new blouse. Hi, you know, and, and that made the difference for me. That was my, my inspiration and my motivation. Today, after my parents have been long gone, 
my motivation are those, actually one grandson is missing out of that photo. It's those three grandsons I have. I want them to be proud. I want them to one day walk back into the state capitol, walk into the secretary's office, and that they tell them, this is the photo of your grandmother. And history will hopefully be able to give them a great story and be able to say, your mother was a, your grandmother was a, I keep confusing mother and grandmother. My husband keeps reminding me they're not my children, they're my grandchildren. I keep telling my daughter that they are my children. But anyway, um, that, that, you know, they will be told that their grandmother was a great public servant. My turning point in my life was that I started a business uh, in my late 20s. And I had an idea. I believed in it. I believed in myself. And I started a business. It wasn't very common uh, during that time to start a business. But in business, everything is about timing. And so it was the right time for the service that I provided. So I started a business with a business partner. We grew um, our business to, into three companies, into 400 employees, lots of hard work, lots of determination, lots of perseverance of not giving up. Even when people would tell us, go back to your job at IBM. What are you doing trying to make your own business? We just kept on. We believed in it. We believed in it. And I will tell you that in 2004, we sold that company that we once started from an idea to a publicly traded company for millions of dollars. So we realized what we like to say, not just the American dream, but the Texas dream. So for me, that was a turning point, the fact that I was able to start my own business, that I was able to work hard, uh, become successful. And then I got to the point that uh, my business allowed me the opportunity, because I had hired enough people to manage day-to-day -day operations. I learned to let go and, and believe that people could do the same as I could in my business. And I started getting involved in my community. And I was so grateful for the success that I had had, for the opportunities that I had been given, that it was only right to give back. And so I started getting involved in, in not-for-profits. I started getting involved in chambers and realizing that not only was I learning, but also I was sharing um, some of my learning experiences with members. And so in 2004, um, Governor Perry called the city of San Antonio and said, we're expanding the number of commissioners on the Texas Department of Transportation uh, would you be, in, please send me a name of an individual that you think might be um, qualified for that position. Well, because I had served in the community, I was known as a woman that not only that I did what I said I was going to do, that I was responsible, that they could depend on me, that I delivered, that, and I had served on our local transit authority board, that the leadership of the community called me in and asked me if I'd be interested in applying. I did. Fast forward, in 2004, I was named to the Texas Department of Transportation, the largest state, one of the largest state agencies in the state, first Latina to serve. And um, when I walked into that commission meeting, I will tell you, I was scared to death. First of all, I had never seen so many tall people, okay? <laughs> that most of them were engineers. For those of you that have an engineering mind, I, I congratulate you because it's, it's amazing the way you think. And so I thought, oh my God, what am I bringing to this commission? They're probably looking at me and thinking, are you kidding me? She's going to be our new commissioner? But you know what? I invested. I prepared. I read every page. I didn't say much okay, at the beginning. I listened. I learned. I watched how everybody else worked, the other three commissioners. And do you know? that three years later, I became their chair. The first female chairwoman of the Department of Transportation in its 90-year history. Yes, I've made history in these positions, but with that history comes responsibility because I'm standing on the shoulders of many others that have worked hard. And so I feel that I have a responsibility to you that I do not just a good job, and my staff, Lisa, Liz is here and Amy's here, they know, because they've worked with me for four and a half years, they know that I not only, we not only work to meet performance measures or to meet goals, we blow your socks off. We exceed them. 
to just meet means that you're just oh, happy. You know, you're driving home, and you say, okay, today I met my goals. I'm good. You know what happens when I drive in in the morning at 6 o'clock and I see the most beautiful sunrise? I'm excited about what I'm going to do. As I'm driving home and I'm seeing the most beautiful sunset, I'm excited that I exceeded the goals that we set for that day, that we made a difference in people's lives, that I'm working hard to make sure that we leave that door wide open for any of you. And that's what we need to do. That's what you need to do when you reach some of your goals, is to not forget that we have a responsibility to each other, to make each other proud. You know, one day, uh, I had a young lady in my office that um, was my speechwriter, and she said to me, uh, I hope I'm making you proud uh, with, uh, with my speeches. And I said, you're making me very proud. I said, I hope that when I speak up there, I make you proud. And that's what it's about. It's about make, working with each other, being a team, making each other proud. And most of all, being proud of yourself. You know, when I look, when I think about it, it, you know, I use so many quotes all the time, and I thought, well, I, I'll share some of those with you. But I thought, quotes you can read. You can find them. The wisdom that I'm sharing with you are real life experiences that you can't read in a book. It's been what I experienced, how I lived my life. And it's all about, like I said, working hard, surrounding yourself with people that believe in you. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for people that believed in me. So Viendo believes in you. The sponsors that are here believe in you. Take advantage of that. You've got to believe in each other. When people first told me that I was smart, I thought, I am? My mother used to tell me I was beautiful. I am? Tell, compliment each other. Compliment yourself. I look at myself in the mirror and I'm pretty proud of myself. Five foot and all? Yeah. Of course, my husband had to move everything to be eye level. And he said, give me a break. When people walk in, he think I'm also, they think I'm also short. All our art pieces are eye level. Yeah. <laughs> but be proud of yourself. Believe in yourself and believe in others. And for those that are naysayers, stay away from them. You're not going to change your mind. You know, if somebody says, oh, you're not going to make, ah. you want to be a what? A pediatrician? You're crazy. And say, you know what? I'll show you. When those people were laughing at me, <laughs> I showed them, didn't I? And so you've got to keep focused on the goal. You've got to make sure that you're proud of yourself, that you do, and you've got to be happy. One of the things that I've learned is that you've got to be happy. And when you find something that you're going to do in life, that you're excited about, you'll, you'll never think you work a day in your life. You know, today, I probably average 80, 85 hours a week. And people are always asking, what do you take besides B12 vitamin? I tell them, I don't take anything. I'm excited about life. I'm excited about what I'm doing. You know, Secretary of State, the, uh, some of the interesting uh, things that would happen to me was that nobody expected that, you know, when you travel the world and uh, they know that you're from Texas, uh, you know, the, you've heard the saying that everything is bigger in Texas. Well, they look at me and they say, is, are things still bigger in Texas? <laughs> and I'd say, of course they are. The governor just made me because he wanted to make sure that we had diversity in this state. But yes, things are bigger in Texas, but so are our futures. And you have an incredible future. Being on the Texas Workforce Commission, I encourage you to visit our website to find out about labor market data, where the most job, the uh, demand and jobs are. Uh, there's a, uh, we've got a website, a reality check, uh, that you can go on, that you can find out you know, which jobs pay. Take advantage. There's, people want to help you. We all believe in you. And we want to help you. And we see success in every one of you. Would, would you have seen success in me? Would you have been able to say, you know, God, that little girl back there, you know, she's going to be a Secretary of State. No. But I knew that I wanted to be somebody. I knew that I wanted to do bigger and better things for my parents. 
to make them proud, to help them. You know, my father came to this country to provide a better life for me. I wanted to work hard to also provide a better life for him. But, you know, I, I brought some, um, I guess, some important things for you to remember uh, about, but I do want to stress on the importance that Texas has the largest Hispanic population, or one of the states that has the largest. And so I want to make sure that, that you understand how important it is for you to pursue a college education and help us raise those numbers. I think the last time I read out of the five million that we've got in Hispanic, young Hispanic students, you know, only 11% have a college education. We need to raise that. And you need to help us. Just as I work hard to make sure that I leave that door wide open, you need to work hard to make sure. Because you know what? The minute that you become a college graduate, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, they'll follow you. It takes one. And the minute that one of you does that, the rest will. If you already have brothers and sisters that graduate from college, you also are following their footsteps. You know, my daughter-in-law today has a, has a PhD. And when I talk to my grandsons, there's no doubt in their mind that they're either going to do the same or better. You know, even that little football player, he talks about making sure that he's just as good as his mom. My son also went to a private university, and he consults. He, he was in business with me. And today, he's able to share the love, the experiences, the fact that he found a, a good wife. I give her all the credit. I give him little credit. I give my grandsons all the credit. But anyway, so, but family's important. And so remember that and be nice. Don't forget to be nice. Be grateful. Even for the things that we wish we'd had that we don't have. Be grateful for what you do have. Be grateful for this opportunity. Be nice to each other. When I leave offices uh, after I finish my terms, I'm always proud and pleased at the fact that people are saddened when I leave versus glad that I'm leaving. And it's because I've always made sure that I'm nice, I'm respectful, I pay attention to people, those are very important things that we must never forget to do. I know the other thing that I also want you to remember is that fear is something that we can overcome. I'm still scared. I'm thinking already of what I'm going to do next, and I get scared, but I don't let that control me. And what happens when you accomplish something that you were scared of, it's an awesome feeling because you did it. So don't let fear control your future, okay? Make sure that you step out of that comfort zone, what feels very comfortable, into a faith zone that you know that you're gonna get done. Don't forget to show up. I think Yogi Berra said, 80% of success is just showing up. A lot of times we get invited to things or we get invited to participate, and we say, no, no, I couldn't do that. Okay, oh, no, no, I, I, I'm too busy. But you know what? You show up, you never know who you're going to meet. You never know what you're going to learn. So show up. It is so important that we be present. Many times, I'm the only Latina woman at an event. And so I asked, didn't we invite? I said, yes, nobody else showed up. So don't be afraid. Be proud. Walk in. Shake hands. Introduce yourself. Show up. And then, of course, the hard work. Don't be afraid of hard work. To me, that's one of the most important things that we must remember. And I think that one of the things I'd like to be remembered for is that I never forgot to reach back and bring someone else along me. You know, I want to show you a photo. When I was uh, sworn in, that is the third grade class from my elementary school. I invited them to come join me because I wanted them to see, and this is from, from an inner city uh, school, and so we arranged for a bus to bring the girls uh, to the sworn in ceremony. Uh, we, had, uh, we gave them a tour here we, on the campus. 
We gave them a tour of the Capitol. We provided them lunch on the bus. And they got to experience, they got to see, and I spoke to them during my swearing in speech because I wanted to tell them I was in your chair, in that chair one day, and look at where I am today. Anything is possible through education, hard work, and staying focused on your goals. So that's the message I bring you. And I hope that you will think in the future, think back to, to my talk. And there are days that you will feel like you can't. There are days that you will hear that you can't. But no one should control your future. You should be in charge of your future. And today, I will tell you that it is your time. There are so many programs, so many resources, so many people that are willing to help you, to guide you. All you need to do is ask for it. And create a plan in your mind of what you want to do, and you will get there. So muchísimas gracias. It's been an honor. I see this state there with a great future when I look out into the audience. And so at this time, I'd like to open it up for any questions that you may have. And, and if you'll come up to the microphone, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you so much. Any questions? Um, my name is Jacqueline. I'm from Irving. And one of my questions is, um, do you think you would be, you would have gotten farther without your family support? So in other words, um, without your family telling you, oh, I want you to be this, Will you be able to push yourself and got in this part in life? Well, I haven't stopped yet. I haven't gotten to exactly where I want to get to yet. So, so I'm still working on it. Family support is very important. Um, you know, like, like I told you, my mother didn't have huge goals for me, so it wasn't like she was telling me, go be a pediatrician or go be an engineer because she didn't know about those careers. But I had it in me. I knew I wanted to do better. And so I had it in me, and I think that's where it comes from. It comes from you. Now, your, your family support, you know, today, uh, you know that man that I talked about that I married at 18? Uh, I'm still married. Uh, so this year we will be celebrating 47 years. Wow. You know, it helped that he stayed cute. So for you young men, you've got to work on staying cute. Okay? He's been my biggest supporter, my biggest champion. So it's important that you do have family support. But remember, don't be dependent on someone else encouraging you. It's in you. It's in your gut. You feel it. And when you're doing the right thing and you're moving up, that you just get re-energized. People ask me, you know, I've told you people ask me, what is it that keeps you going? I get re-energized. Coming here and speaking with you all, I'm re-energized because I see what the future is. So, so don't... Family support is great, but remember, it's all up to you and it's in you, okay? And remember, and I'm still going places. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Nisha. I'm from Los Fresnos. And my question is, um, did you always know that you wanted to be in politics, or when was it that you discovered that you wanted to be in politics? You know, I didn't grow up in a family that uh, discussed politics at the dinner table. Since my father was from Mexico, he didn't vote, um, which is another thing that you all must do, is get involved in, in making sure that uh, at 18, you register to vote and you go out and vote. Um, but I got interested when I started reading about how it affected my day-to-day, -day, how it affected my business, how it was going to affect my future, the people that were getting elected. And so I thought, I need to make sure that I'm educated on who I'm voting for. I need to make sure that we put the right people in place that are going to be good for me, my family, my business, and the future of this country. And so I didn't find that out till I was kind of like in my 20s of, of interest. But, but for you all, you need to start early on. The, the, the day that you register to vote, start reading, and there's as much material as you can. But one advice that I would say is don't just 
don't, don't just vote for someone because you think, well, that's who my parents or that's who my friends are voting. You vote for the person that you believe is right for your future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to know what was the best piece of advice you ever got like throughout your educational and professional career? Well, I think when, you know, when people believe in you, uh, I remember uh, in my, uh, one of my first jobs, um, I had a, um, a gentleman and a, and a woman that um, I was in a mental health um, facility. Uh, we were taking care of emotionally disturbed children. And, uh, and they spent time with me. They both took me to dinner and uh, they told me that I was extremely smart. This was before I had gone back to school. Okay? that I was extremely smart, that I probably could do anything that I set my mind to, that I had a great work ethic, because uh, I worked hard. And that kind of started me like, oh, okay, well, I can do more. So, so I, I think when somebody takes the time to tell you, you think you're smart, you think you can do things, you believe you can, but when people start acknowledging that, it just soared. Uh, and so there's, there's no stopping me. It hasn't stopped me yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name Hi. is Elsie Triana, and you said that you didn't know what you wanted to do and that your parents didn't uh, necessarily know a lot about college. And my question for you is, um, even though you didn't grow up with the same resources and advantages as other people, um, how did you... Uh, begin to get involved in public service and like how did you know that that was the route you wanted to take? Well first of all once you do it and you see like my first my, my first volunteer was Avance and I don't know I think you have an Avance um, in, in, in South Texas and in Houston uh, and in San Antonio we certainly do but I remember walking into that not-for-profit and what they did was they did parenting education okay um, and I, I remember walking into the children's room and I saw a little girl that had big brown eyes and she looked at me and I, I looked back at her and I thought, I want to help you. And so once you get involved in giving back, it, it's just an awesome feeling that you get. And then you start remembering how blessed you are. And so it just goes on. So I always just tell people, you know, with my right hand, I work to make enough money. With the left hand, with my heart, I work to make sure that I make a difference in people's lives to thank God for all the blessings that I have received so I don't forget to give back. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brenda Salcedo. Um, you mentioned that you um, sprouted your own business, mm -hmm. and I had a question. How do you make your business grow, and how do you, like, build it from the bottom up? Now, we had an idea, uh, and so we tested it before we left our jobs. We, we tested it, and we did see that there was a demand. And then we worked hard at it. Um, I think, and I will tell you that uh, today, and even in state government, okay, not just in my own business, I am most grateful for the people that have worked with me, that have made me look good in state government, and that have worked hard in my business to make it grow. Because I was responsible for bringing in business. But and I was in the healthcare business, so I hired nurses, physical therapists, uh, physicians. And so on. But we all worked together because we all believed in the mission that we were providing. And so you create an environment that welcomes people, the smartest, the most talented, the most certified. And you just find yourself that you're, again, you're exceeding goals, okay? When, when we would go and take care of a patient, not only did we take care of the patient, but we asked questions, what can we do? Family, how do we help you get through this? We took care of you from the day that you were born till end of life care. And people would write about us and, and tell people how wonderful of a service we provided. That's because we exceeded your expectations. So remember that when you start a business, the thing that sets you apart is you exceed the expectations of the product they buy, of the service that you provide. And I used to tell my staff, they can't live without us. Isn't it wonderful? The service we're giving them, they can't live without us. So that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Hello, my name is Daniel Vargas. I'm from Houston, Texas. And um, I just want to start off by saying that most of the students that are here are involved in some type of um, college uh, process. Um, you know, they receive aid from these organizations. Um, so um, what I want to say is that, you know, these groups of people who start their own organizations to reach out to us are only reaching out to those elite students who want an education. Um, but, however, we can't forget that um, there are schools that are predominantly minorities that have, I guess, fallen into the standards that society has placed on them. And um, so they don't see education as um, necessarily the way to succeed. And so, in a way, um, these programs are helping out the the few who know what they want to do with their lives, but there's nobody to kind of guide these students who have uh, limited their potential. Um, so what should we as young leaders and what should prominent, um, uh, prominent people in our society, such as yourself, do to help those students who are unfortunately minorities who have fallen already um, into thinking that they're, they're not capable of um, much more than what they are expected. Well, first of all, I tell you, I love your question and I love your heart. Thank you. Um, we must not give up. And that's, that's where it comes in of pay it forward. Okay. You've been given this opportunity. You've been exposed to this. You know where you want to go or you think you know where you want to go. So now it's your turn to pay it forward. So you have to go back. Sometimes kids will listen more to someone your age than they might listen to me. You know, many of you are thinking, oh, she reminds me of my grandmother. <laughs> All I have to say is, if I remind you of your grandmother, it's be but I'm a young grandmother. <laughs> I have playlists that you would love to have. <laughs> I know how to do some of the dancing that you all do that even embarrasses my husband. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> go back. So, so this is your chance to pay it forward, to go back into those schools and tell them. When you, when you enter college, you go back and you tell them, look, I'm at UT, I'm at A&M, I'm at Texas State, I'm at Harvard, I'm at Yale. And they'll listen to you. And that will make you feel good that you were blessed with the opportunity, but you haven't forgotten where you came from. And you're, gonna, you're committed to paying it forward. And I'm not forgetting either. That's why I brought my, my elementary school. And oftentimes, I go back into my neighborhood. Uh, we sponsor families for Christmas. I take my grandsons to see, uh, be part of that. Uh, so we must never forget. You know, whenever I've forgotten to be humble, and that sometimes you do that, is God quickly reminds me that he didn't bring me here for me to be arrogant. He brought me here to make sure that I was, that I shared my story, that I shared my successes, so that you too can believe that you can accomplish either as much or more than I have. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kevin Chrisman. And before I ask my question, I just want to say that I'm from Brownsville. So I grew up close to the border as well as my parents. So growing up, they had like a rough childhood. Like my, uh, my mom, her father walked out on her and she had to help her mom raise five other children. My father had both his parents died at 14 and he had to provide for his and other brothers and sisters by being a carpenter, a welder, stuff like that. But because they had a rough childhood, they, that, they didn't let themselves overcome to that, so they made a name for themselves. So I guess my question is to you is, what's uh, been your difficult, most difficult challenge that you have overcome in your life? Ooh, you know, there's, there's been many. Uh, people often ask me, um, you know, has, has it been a challenge because you're a woman? No. Has it been a challenge because you're Hispanic? Mm, maybe, but no. I, I think my biggest challenge is believing in myself. Um, you know, sometimes I work so hard to prove to others that I can do it, but I think at the end of the day, I'm proving to myself that I can do it. So the challenges that I have faced are challenges that I've posed on myself. And so we have to overcome those and just stay focused on the goal.
that we can do it. Because like I tell you, I, I mean, I still get intimidated at, at uh, places that I have to go, but I, I you know, I pull myself from my bootstraps, like that we say in Texas, and, and I walk in, or I do it. People will ask me, can you do this? Yes, I can, and then I get in my car and think, oh my God, what was I saying? How can I do this? But, but those are the challenges, challenges that we impose on ourselves that we really need to let go because we can do it. Thank you. Adam, one more question. Can mm -hmm. I take a picture with you? Of course. <laughs> you see, when I was little, I wasn't invited as much to sports and proms and so forth, and now I take, everybody wants to take a picture with me. <laughs> everybody wants to take me to the dance because they've heard I'm a good dancer. And so, yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're going to be just fine. Hello, my name is Leon Ivido. I'm from Austin, Texas, but I live in Flocaville. Before I ask you my question, I just want to personally congratulate and thank you for this outstanding speech that you just provided for us. Thank you. Your message, and then the message of all of the, our previous presenters, lecturers, and key to, uh, key, uh, keynote speakers, undoubtedly, I'm sure, resonates in all of our hearts. And I would like to extend to you this fact that no matter where we go in our lives, if we perhaps go to higher academics or if we go into the military, if we go to STEM or STEAM-based uh, industries or sectors, your message and this program will live on with us. So I wanted to thank you for that. And as far as my question is concerned, First, I have to tell you, you should run for political office. You're great. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, as far as my question is concerned, uh, because I have interests in politics, civil engagement, uh, particularly the influence of pedagogy, especially in different socioeconomic conditions, my question is, in your line of work, what are the most pertinent issues you have in trying to manage our state insofar as we have so many different demographics, so many different thinkings, so many different cultures. How do you apply diplomacy? How, how do you effectively manage crises? We have to work together. <laughs> I think that's, that's, what we're that's what our nation is facing, is the fact that it doesn't matter. You know, when I traveled the world, people are so curious about Texas. We have a population of 26 million people. We have a tremendous sense of pride, okay? So people would always ask me, how do you all do it? How do you all work together, be in such a large state, having diversity, okay? And it's because it, for us, it doesn't matter that you and I may disagree on how we're gonna get there. What we do agree is that we wanna provide a better future for yourself, for your family, for your loved ones, Okay, and for your community, and for the state. And so as, if we can just check our egos at the door and just commit that we're gonna work together for the right reason, we not, and, and not, get, not worry about who's gonna get the credit, we can do so much. And I'm very, very optimistic about the future of Texas with you all, because I think you get it. You understand that. You've got that passion. You've got that commitment. You want to move ahead. And we are making sure that we provide you an environment that you will reach your goals, that you will realize your dreams. That I commit to you. And I know that together with you young ones and us who are a little more mature, and we share our wisdom with you and you share your dreams with us, we can accomplish anything. Great, thank you so but much. But do pursue a political career, because I think you've got a great mind. <laughs> thank thank you. 
Hello, my name is John Rodriguez. I'm from El Paso, Texas, and I would like to thank you for being here today, taking the time out of your day to come and speak to us and going on stage and inspiring us with your story. Um, as for my question, I would like to know what is your biggest regret, whether it was in your academic life or like in your career? My biggest regret. Well, I don't, I don't know that it's a, a regret, but um, I'm going to share something. Do we have media here? No, no media here? I think, and not my biggest, because I still believe that I can overcome that regret, is that I've been blessed uh, to have served this great state of Texas without ever running for an office. And so uh, at this point in my life where I'm exploring uh, new opportunities, uh, I'm considering that. And so I look at regrets uh, as opportunities of, I still have time to do it. Um, but other than that, I will tell you, I, I've li my life has been amazing, has been extraordinary. I don't have one thing to get depressed about, even though I do sometimes, uh, or, or, or regret because look at what I've been able to accomplish, a little girl from the West Side to standing here before you and sharing my story and hoping to inspire you. So I, I don't have many regrets, uh, but that's something that I'm, uh, I may be looking at. So maybe I'll be needing some help uh, with uh, some of you young ones helping me. Thank you very much. We have a token of our appreciation, and Santiago Santana is going to present this. All right. Well, to piggyback what Leon said, uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come talk to a really great group of high school leaders here that I truly believe, and I heard that you really believed in us. And on behalf of Subiendo, the UT, Macomb School of Business, and the Otters, uh, we would like to say thank you, and here's a gift to you from us. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks again. Sure. Thank you again, Commissioner Andrade. It was a very inspirational message and certainly resonates with our mission and vision of Subiano. So thank you very much for your time and for being with us. Um, students, please. Um, Congr thank your table hosts that have joined us again. We do appreciate their time for being with us. And um, I understand now that UT is closing at 5 o'clock today for the tropical depression. So um, we wish safe travels for our table hosts who are going to be traveling in the rain. So please be careful. And um, thank you very much for the afternoon. <laughs>